Uh, I'm Andy Miller, Department of Geography and Environmental Systems here at UMBC. I'm uh, the uh, coordinator for our departmental seminar. We're very pleased to offer you a seminar from today's speaker who will be introduced in just a moment. Before we get started, I'm just going to share a screen for a moment to tell you about next week's seminar, which we're very excited about. Um, this will be. Um, hopefully you can see that. Next week's seminar is on the future of the National Environmental Policy Act, and our speaker will be Jeannie Lee, who is actually uh, chief environmental Cal uh, lawyer for the state of California and senior advisor for the National Environmental Policy Act at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And she will be accompanied by Jomar Maldonado, director for NEPA, at, also at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. For those of you who are interested, that seminar will not be recorded because I, I suspect it's because they're talking about federal government policy changes and they probably don't want to be uh, recorded somewhere saying things that aren't official policy exactly. So um, for anybody who's interested, there will not be a recording of that seminar, so you'll need to attend it in person if you want to be there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the stage to Aaron Hamner, who is going to introduce our speaker, Aaron, before I do that, I have to put you on stage. Just a second. Okay, go ahead. Introduce our speaker, please. Dr. Kelly Kay is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at UCLA. She completed her PhD in geography at Clark University. And prior to UCLA, she held positions at the London School of Economics and UC Berkeley. Dr. Kelly is a political ecolo ecologist who draws heavily from geographical, political economy, and legal geography, and her work tackles questions of natural resource management and governance in North America. Thanks. All right, Kelly, you are on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Let me get my screen all set up. Can you see everything? Yep. Yep, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. And Andy, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm really excited and honored to get to present my work to your department, which has lots of folks whose work I really respect in it. Um, so my talk today is primarily going to be focused around some ongoing work that I've been doing um, with one of my doctoral students, Andrea Fernaro, um, and it's focused on understanding the challenges for just energy transitions in Los Angeles and four cities more generally. So before I get into that, I wanna just spend a couple minutes speaking about my work um, since the project I'm presenting today is collaborative research. Um, so as Aaron said, I'm a political ecologist um, and my work is concerned with the changing relationships between law, land and capitalist accumulation. Um, beyond the work that I'm presenting here today, I have two other major ongoing projects, which I'll touch on super briefly and then spend the rest of the time talking about the LA Green New Deal. Um, so first, I've been on a year long writing fellowship this year from the American Council of Learned Societies, ACLS, working on a book project tracing the socio ecological and socio economic impacts of the growth of investor ownership of private industrial timberland in the US. So starting around the 1990s, the vast majority of vertically integrated forest products companies, so the sort of big players in paper or lumber that you know have familiar names, International Paper, Georgia Pacific, um, restructured for preferential corporate tax treatment. And one major outcome of this process was a huge transfer of forest lands into the hands of institutional investors. Um, so entities like pension funds and university endowments. To give you an idea of the scale of this change in land ownership, in 2006, the vertically integrated pulp and paper company International Paper sold off the majority of its US land holdings in a single transaction. In this deal, it transferred 5.1 million acres to two timber investment management organizations. And these are groups that pool institutional capital and invest it in private forests. The $6.1 billion deal was the largest transfer of land ownership in a single transaction in the US since the Louisiana Purchase. And it is just one of many, many similar land sales that have occurred across the US. 
Um, so this work that I'm in the midst of right now um, combines interviews and participant observation at investor conferences um, with extensive archival research um, and focuses on three key aspects of society forest relations that have been changed as institutional investors have come to be the largest owner group of private forests in the US. So I look at recreation, labor, um, and the changing ways that profit comes to be derived from forest land. So the photo on the screen on the left is from some recent field work I've done for the project. I actually just got back from Oregon over the weekend. Um, and as you can see from the sign in the photo, the area pictured is under a private recreation lease. Uh, which is notable because the property's owner, Warehouser, has historically allowed free and open access to their properties in the Pacific Northwest. And this is one example of some of these change, the changing nature of both recreation and accumulation with regard to private forests. Um, sec the second big thing that I'm working on right now, um, which is a project with Chris Knudsen at the University of Hawaii and Aleda Cantor at Portland State University. Um, it's a is it a multi year qualitative research project looking at the end of sugar production on the island of Maui and the ways that native Hawaiians and local environmental organizations have worked to reclaim stream flow for species. As well as native Hawaiian traditional and customary practices like taro growing. So, we've already published 2 pieces of from this work already um, 1 in geoform and the other in environment and planning E. And the third, um, which we're working on finishing up this summer, is focused on the extensive system of ditches that were built in the late 1800s and early 1900s by oligopolistic sugar companies that colonized the island and evaded in the eventual takeover of the Hawaiian Kingdom and U.S. annexation. Through hundreds of miles of these ditches, water is moved from the wet side of the island um, to the dry side, originally for irrigating vast sugar plantations, um, but now for a wider variety of uses, including municipal drinking water and tourism. In the work, we argue that while sugar production on Maui has ended, which uh, actually only ended in 2016, uh, this ditch water ditch infrastructure continues to instantiate plantation logics and colonial era environmental management retaining sugar era path dependencies for the future of the island, even as plantation sugar itself has faded away. Um, so in the photo on the right here shows a local activist in East Maui, um, which is the wet side of the island, um, uh, who's showing us a map of the ditches before taking myself and my collaborators out on a walking tour of the sugar company's vast water conveyance system, which is, was extremely interesting. Okay, so I'm obviously happy to say more about either of these projects during the Q&A um, if folks have any questions, but I'm gonna now spend the bulk of my time talking about um, the LA Green New Deal. Um, so the project on the LA Green New Deal was a collaborative effort between myself and one of my PhD students. And we decided to submit for some funding to do research together on a topic that interested both of us um, but wasn't really central to either of our work. Um, so Andrea had been conducting her doctoral work in Germany, um, tracing their national coal phase out. Um, and she was actually really surprised to see that Los Angeles was announcing a phase out of natural gas, which I'll get into shortly, um, because she thought that was really unusual from her European context. And at the time I had been doing some research on urban oil drilling in Los Angeles, and I was wondering how the newly announced LA Green New Deal would impact that. So uh, in early 2020, we came together and we applied for and received funding from a local private foundation. We were all set to hit the ground running and then COVID-19 hit, which I'm sure we all have our COVID research stories, um, but luckily we were pretty able to adapt both you know, being in Los Angeles and having to talk to a lot of policymakers that were used to having meetings on phone or Zoom. Um, so this research project was really important to us because it provided us with an opportunity to keep doing our research um, sort of in the height of the pandemic. Uh, so today I'm gonna be mostly presenting on a paper that Andrea and I have um, revised and resubmitted to the journal Political Geography. Um, but just to note, we've also produced a 70-ish page policy report for our funders, um, which is pictured on the slide and which um, is available on my faculty page at UCLA, but I'm also happy to send it to anyone 
who might be interested in in reviewing it. Um, it's a bit more policy oriented than um, than the article that I'm going to be presenting, though there's a lot of crossover. Um, so the project combines 22 semi structured interviews of one to I think our longest was three hours with an extensive um, review of um, recordings and minutes of city and public utility board meetings, um, 40 years of LA Times articles on energy and climate issues and the LA Times being the paper of record for our study site, and then a variety of other reports and materials, particularly materials produced by consultants hired by the LA Department of Water and Power um, to conduct viability studies and economic impact studies. So in, in April 2019, Los Angeles's mayor, Eric Garcetti, announced the LA Green New Deal, an ambitious plan to shift the, the city's power system to 100% renewables by 2045. This was aligned with several state level policy requirements, including the state of California's renewable por portfolio standard, um, but had a faster implementation timetable. And there are other differences as well, but I think that's maybe the most notable. The decision to transition the system was going to be supported by the largest energy modeling exercise ever conducted, um, which LADWP contract contracted the US National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, to complete. With the results of that modeling finished, the City Council has since voted to move our the timetable on the LA Green New Deal up, committing to 100% renewable power now by 2035, which is feeling like it's just around the corner. Um, and so now 10 years sooner than they are required to by the state of California. Los Angeles is unique among US cities because it has a vertically integrated municipal utility, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power or LADWP for short. DWP is the largest municipal utility in the country with 3.1 million residential customers. Um, the vertical integration of DWP is important for the story here since the utility owns the large majority of its power generating capacity, both within and outside of California, something that I will explain in more detail shortly. So a major piece of this decarbonization plan and sort of the focus of the article that Andrea and I wrote, um, because it was an important element that, that caused a lot of conflict with the utilities union, um, was a focus on retiring three natural gas-fired power plants, the Haynes Harbor and Scattergood generating stations. And Scattergood is pictured here on the slide. These facilities are located on the south coast of Los Angeles, um, very close to the airport, um, and rely on ocean water for cooling. I mean, you can see in the photo, this is prime real estate on the beach in Los Angeles. Um, this ocean water cooling, um, or once through cooling as it's called, is a practice that will soon be outlawed by the state of California um, and accelerated, but does not entirely explain the phase out of Haynes Harbor and Scattergood. Um, so these three facilities are a absolutely huge part of the LADWP power system. The three generating stations alone account for 40% of LADWP's total capacity. Um, but really importantly here, they currently make up 89% of the utilities capacity within Los Angeles County. So, you know, almost all of the power that's not produced outside of LA is being produced by these facilities. Um, so the, dis the decision to reduce reliance on them will have major impacts on the city. Um, and many critics have cited concerns about reliability issues that may be caused by taking them fully offline, pointing to, for example, rolling brownouts, um, which was a big problem during the summer of 2020, when record high temperatures across much of the Western US created huge demand for power to run air conditioners and meet other household demands. And this is likely to become an accelerating issue. The rolling brownouts meant that many, many people's power across Southern California had to be sort of strategically in blocks shut off because there wasn't enough power to go around. So. While, as I alluded to above, the announcement of the phase out of these facilities as part of the larger LA Green New Deal had many critics, I would argue that no critics were stronger than IBEW 18, the LADWP union. IBEW 18 is um, the local of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and it represents about 8,000 workers, 
totaling about 92% of all employees at DWP, which is an absolutely tremendously large um, utility. And I think importantly here, as compared to other municipal and investor owned utilities, DWP has unusually high rates of union membership, which some informants for the project attributed to the fact that their union includes all workers at DWP, not just electrical workers. Um, so clerical workers, tree trimmers, truck drivers, all sorts of workers in the union are all part of IBEW 18. They aren't like separately unionized as they might be in other um, utilities. And so this really high level of unionization um, for an important sect of the government makes IBEW a, a powerful player in LA local politics. Okay, so on the night of the LA Green New Deal rollout, which was being celebrated at a large party at the mayor's residence, IBEW 18 was protesting outside. This was a story that several informants for the project told us. Um, interestingly, either from the side of being at the party and having the party disrupted, or from the side of being outside the party and protesting the LA Green New Deal. Um, so, while tensions between labor and environmental goals are certainly not unusual in decarbonization planning, Los Angeles is generally thought to be a fairly progressive city and its unions uh, generally don't support, are not like anti-environmental in their positions generally. Um, so, this isn't necessarily par for the course here. Yet, the union itself and its advocacy arm working Californians have been actively protesting the plan and, and the mayor himself. This has manifested in them running attack ads against Mayor Garcetti, financially supporting his opponents and other anti-environmental candidates for local office to try and create a counter block against him um, and picketing outside um, LADWP's offices and in other prominent locations around the city. And the, the photo on the screen is a photo of one of these many um, working Californians protests against the LA Green New Deal. So what happens? How do we understand the opposition of IBEW 18, a generally progressive union and a generally progressive city? And perhaps most importantly, um, probably especially importantly, since um, you all do not live in Los Angeles, so the particularities of LA politics might not be that interesting to you, what lessons can be drawn from the case to inform just energy transitions in the future and in other places? Okay, so very briefly in our article, Andrea and I argue that the opposition of IBEW 18 can be explained by 3 types of what we um, are calling sort of scalar mismatch or scalar misalignments and these scalar misalignments, which I will go over briefly in the next couple of slides are things that are likely to cause issues for many municipal scale decarbonization plans, not just Los Angeles's. Um, so we borrow this concept of scalar mismatch from work on environmental governance. And um, just to be clear, because I'm very aware that scale is a hotly debated topic within geography, um, our particular approach to thinking about scale in this case study is, I think, summed up nicely um, by this quote from J. Christopher Brown and Mark Purcell, um, in which they say, quote, Scale and scalar configurations are not an independent variable that can cause outcomes. Rather, they are a strategy used by political groups to pursue a particular agenda. And I think this particular approach to scale will become clear as the talk goes on, um, especially when I get into talking about um, the arenas of political engagement and then I think it's two or three slides in. So um, I'm going to go through each of these scalar mismatches, um, starting with. First, the misalignment between the current and future geographies of Los Angeles's power system. And the map on the screen, which is pulled from the report that we produced, um, I think really highlights the spatially ex expansive nature of the DWP system, which brings power from across the Western US into the LA basin. Aside from the natural gas fired power stations that are being phased out within Los Angeles, um, reliability and affordability for LA's rate payers is primarily provided by coal, wind, solar, and hydroelectric facilities, all located pretty far outside of Los Angeles. The system currently depends on the production of power in five states, which are connected through 3,600 miles of transmission lines and 10,400 miles of distribution lines. 
There are currently plans for the system of transmission and generation to move further east. Some city council meetings have alluded to the fact that our power system may be reliant on nine western states. Um, the idea being that a move eastward would allow DWP to capture wind power in New Mexico. Um, and there's also been a lot of talk about investing in large utility scale wind generation facilities in Wyoming and Montana. And again, since LADWP is municipally owned and vertically integrated, this move east does not just mean purchasing power from more places, but it means the city of Los Angeles itself will be investing in actual facilities and transmission infrastructure in these um, new geographies. So for a variety of reasons, including California state laws, path dependencies, economies of scale, and land prices in Los Angeles and Southern California generally, the city is slated to become even more dependent on out-of-state facilities with this rapid transition to renewables. This trajectory is alarming for organized labor because it means that new jobs in both construction and maintenance are unlikely to be located in Los Angeles. And while rooftop solar, um, I think, is frequently understood to be an important source of localized renewable power that can be produced within the city, historically, jobs installing sol rooftop solar panels are low skilled and low paying. Um, solar panels generally require little maintenance work compared to the complex um, engineering and electrical work of running a power plant. Um, and there's already a tradition of these jobs going to non unionized contract workers. So those don't really present opportunities. Um, okay, let me see where I'm at on time. So I think the quote on the screen nicely explains the major issue with the ways that the changing geographies of the power system come into conflict with the existing geographies of the IBEW 18. The quote reads, I think with DWP specifically, part of it is that these jobs running these gas plants, they're all jobs here in the city. I mean, so much of what the clean energy transition for Los Angeles seems to look like and how it's been thought about, it's stuff that's happening far away. I mean, we have transmission lines stretching out to Arizona, to Palo Verde, um, and into Utah, to Inner Mountain, and you know, up to the Pacific Northwest for hydropower into all sorts of pockets all over the West. Um, Navajo, which is a facility in Arizona, um, on the Navajo Nation, um, there's been talk at the City Council about repurposing the Navajo lines. So it's like, yes, there are a lot of jobs to be created doing stuff, but a lot of that is not happening where these people live. And I think as this quote highlights well, for the system to successfully transition to 100% renewables by 2035, it has to become more reliant on out-of-state power, not less. This presents an existential challenge to local utility workers who will not readily be able to take up the new jobs that are being created. Okay. The second moment of scalar mismatch that we discuss in the paper um, and that we talk a bit about in our report has to do with jurisdiction, which is related in some ways to the geographies of the power system, but it's distinct as well. So jurisdictional issues, um, jurisdiction presents major issues, not just with the LA Green New Deal, but with municipal scale Green New Deal planning more generally or decarbonization planning more generally. So within Los Angeles, the mayor's office has actually a, quite a lot of power over the utility, over city budgets, city regulations, zoning, planning within the city and within the county, um, but they're also bound by many constraints as well. So as an environmental activist who we interviewed for the project, and this particular individual was really interesting because he played a really key role in convincing the mayor in sort of an 11th hour decision to include the closure of um, Haynes Harbor and Scattergood in the final plan, um, he provides an important reflection on some of the major limitations that come with the LA Green New Deal as it's been written. So as he puts it, if they lose jobs, there is no leadership, there is no 20 year plan. You know, there is no Green New Deal for lack of a better term to say like the federal government is going to invest so much money. And then don't worry if you lose your job and you can't build natural gas power plants in LA or wherever, or expand the refinery, or do more drilling, because guess what? We have all these other good paying union jobs for you. So we're not like totally jumping up and down and celebrating the announcement of the LA Green New Deal. I mean, we think it's great. We celebrate that and we worked very hard on that, but we think that there's a lot missing. And what is missing is that vision and that plan, a 10 year plan, a 20 year plan. How are you going to do that? How are you going to create these jobs? 
So what this quote reflects is the fact that the mayor's office is not able to intervene outside of its jurisdiction to create jobs. The mayor is bound by term limits and the next mayor, um, which is actually being decided sh shortly. Um, there's a lot of election stuff going on in LA right now um, because Garcetti has been appointed as the ambassador to India by the Biden administration, um, which is interesting given what I'm about to get into. Um, you know, the next mayor may not have the same priorities, um, the same specific vision of how decarbonization might happen, um, the same focus on climate or energy at all. Um, and I think furthermore, and this is important for any municipal scale Green New Deal planning, the mayor is required to maintain a balanced budget, presenting limitations for the kinds of deficit spending that the federal government, for example, could be able to do to create jobs and smooth the transition. So, you know, I think the last thing I'll say on that is that um, since LADWP is municipally owned, there's no real way to pass on the costs of stranded assets except to its ratepayers, who are just the citizens of Los Angeles who elect the mayor who is the head of LADWP. Um, so stranded assets um, is the industry term for infrastructure that may have to be taken offline before the end of its usable life. Um, or assets that due to climate change instead become liabilities and things like coal fired power plants or natural gas fired power plants definitely fall into this category. Um, stranded assets are a huge concern for energy providers um, since building new infrastructure to replace them is very costly. Um, but unlike for LADWP, uh, for investor owned utilities, of which there are many in the US, there are a greater way, range of ways of passing on these costs beyond just to the citizens of the municipality, the, the, the utility services. Okay, so lastly, the third major trend that we found in our interviews and the third dimension of scalar mismatch that we look at um, is the difference in the scales of political engagement between the mayor and the union. Um, so to boil it down even further, the mayor and the union are both engaging in climate change related politics, but they are doing so in different arenas. So I'll start by saying that many of our informants noted this, um, that basically the mayors of large cities in general and large cities in California in this case, um, generally tend to have higher ambitions often for state or national political office in Biden's appointment to the Biden to this ambassador or sorry, Garcetti's appointment to this ambassadorship, I think, speaks to this. Um, it was well known at the time of the LA Green New Deal that Garcetti had national political ambitions. Um, there was a lot of talk at the time that he was planning on running for president. Um, and he was, I think importantly, operating in environmental politics uh, at the international scale. So for one key example, Garcetti is currently the chair of the city's climate leadership group a global network that's uh, sort of commonly referred to using the shorthand C40. This is an international group of local politicians, um, a lot of mayors, who have come together to try and take action on climate change, sort of appealing to a higher scale. Garcetti assumed the chairship of C40 shortly after announcing the LA Green New Deal, and there was some speculation amongst the people we interviewed for this project that he took this bold action in Los Angeles at least in part to bolster his credentials so he could assume this prestigious chairship. So if I can turn your attention to the quote on the screen, I think it's really representative of the kind of international policy making arenas that Garcetti and other members of the mayor's administration were operating within. So this quote um, from an interview with one of the city's first sustainability officers hints at the major involvement of international players and big money in the city's sustainability planning. He says, quote, um, a person whose name, a person who we met at the party whose name I've redacted, got the US arm of the organization PricewaterhouseCooper, which is an international accounting and consulting firm to commit. They were willing to do a couple hundred thousand dollars of free work, and then it became a million and a half by the end. And we couldn't have done the work to do the analysis and also just manage it because it was such a big lift. And then we also got some help from Bloomberg Associates on housing and transportation. Um, so I think it's important to note that LA's sustainability office itself has, I think, two employees right now at 1.3. So producing this 
the types of landmark environmental legislation that they have would not be possible without the pro bono help of the international consulting and philanthropy community, whose aim is to enact legislation in LA that can serve as a model for other cities across the US and the world. While Garcetti and other past and future mayors are often looking to higher levels of government and governance, IBEW 18, the LADWP union, is operating within the bounds of LA city politics. So one thing that was imminently clear from our interviews is that IBEW 18 are a super strong union and a major player in local politics. The union boss, um, Brian Darcy, who many, almost everyone that we talked to mentioned by name, I think it's probably unusual for, every, for 22 people to know the name of the head of a union in their city. Um, Brian Darcy is understood to hold as much power within the city and within LADWP as the mayor himself, um, but the union's power is concentrated primarily at the local scale. So as power brokers in LA, IBEW 18 could shut down a political career but only at the scale of Los Angeles. While they have made and broken many candidates for local office, they are unable to intervene in meaningful ways when Garcetti is making policy and doing politics that is ultimately aimed at state, national, and international scales. Okay, so to briefly wrap all of this up, I began by posing the question, how can we understand the opposition of IBW 18, a generally progressive union in a generally progressive city? And perhaps most importantly, what lessons can be drawn from the case to inform just transitions in the future and in other places? Um, so address, to address the first piece, I have argued that there are several critical scalar, scalar misalignments um, in this specific case that helped to explain why IBEW 18 had such strong opposition to the LA Green New Deal. So to remind you, these are the current and future geographies of the energy system, the limits imposed by the mayor of LA's jurisdiction, and the scales of political activism and engagement that the mayor and the union are each respectively engaged in. Um, so these scalar issues are front and center in the LA case, but also speak to issues that could plague other municipalities attempting to decarbonize their energy systems. With the ongoing failure of international climate change negotiations, especially with regard to the US's participation in them, there has been a strong interest in more local interventions, including things like energy remunicipalization, re I can never say that word, Transition towns and city or regional scale decarbonization planning. Um, these are important efforts, of course, but as this case illustrates, it's also critical to really, really take account of the limitations of these types of municipal scale interventions and sort of plan accordingly. And I think also important for this case, um, in which I wasn't able to get into a huge amount today, is that the IBEW 18 were not um, like consultative players. They were not involved in the planning process of the LA Green New Deal in meaningful ways. And I think that this is pretty straightforward from any kind of um, participatory policy making. But I think I will also say that um, impacted communities, when it comes to just transitions, that all impacted communities need to be engaged and accounted for at all stages of the planning process. I think this was a huge oversight. And the, you know, it's we're several years on and still trying to rectify this um, strong opposition from the DWP union. Let's see, where are we? Okay, so um, one last thing before Q and A. Um, I just I want to say a, a few words about where this project is headed next because I presented sort of the part that's finished. Um, so on the screen is the Inner Mountain Power Plant (IPP) for short. Most people call it IPP, um, which is located in Delta, Utah, a small town in central sort of central western Utah. This plant was, I mean, an LADWP plant, so it was built in maturity, owned by LADWP, and it's a critical critical piece of infrastructure in the power system, um, more critical than ever with the closure of the um, Haynes Harbor and Scattergood natural gas um, generating stations. So currently, IPP is the only full-fired power plant in that services Los Angeles, and in 2025, it will be converted to run on natural gas, which is interesting given that LA has decided to close all of its natural gas facilities within the city. 
Um, but I guess also not that surprising that they would outsource um, sort of dirty parts of the system to other places. Um, but more importantly, for my purposes, the plan, the plan going into the future um, is to convert the facility to run on green hydrogen. So utility scale green hydrogen is very much an experimental technology. Um, at this point, there are no examples of successful utility scale green hydrogen pro projects in the US at this time. Um, but this uh, plan to re retool IPP to run on green hydrogen is a super critical part of the modeling that NREL did for DWP that's informed the entire plan for their renewable energy transition. So basically, there's no plan to get to 100% renewables on the 2035 timetable that does not assume that green hydrogen will be part of the energy mix. Um, so I put together some proposals to work with a group of my grad students to understand how IPP presents challenges to our current approaches to thinking about environmental justice and just transitions. Um, IPP is a very critical part of LA's infrastructure and is gonna be even more critical into the future Yet at the same time, the test case for this experimental technology is not taking place at one of the plants in the city, but is instead being undertaken in a small community that is historically um, and continues to be deeply economically dependent on LADWP. Um, so for those of you who have seen the film Chinatown, which is about LADWP's exploitative relationship with small and distant communities who were pulled into the water system a century ago, draining their lakes and aquifers and pre prevent, pre sorry, presenting irreparable harm um, to local tribes and other residents, I think there's some interesting parallels to be drawn here from the increasing reliance on these small communities to provide power um, for the city, especially this sort of dangerous or dirty power. So the future work that I'm gonna be doing here is really concerned with how the citizens of Delta are being exposed to high levels of environmental risk at the same time as many indices of environmental injustice within Los Angeles are showing record improvements. My hope is to conduct interviews at IPP and in Delta with workers and residents to understand how this green hydrogen conversion will affect them and hopefully ultimately to make an argument for how city scale environmental justice Planning cannot leave out impacted constituents just because they are physically outside of municipal borders. Okay, so I'll leave that here. Um, thanks so much, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. And I will unshare my screen, I think. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. That was absolutely fascinating. There's so many uh, moving parts here to think about. Um, so what we normally do is ask people to pl place, place their questions in the chat. For some reason, I cannot get the chat to appear on my screen. Aaron, can you see it? I can see the this, chat. Okay, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I can't see it, but um, are, are there any questions in the chat at this point? Yes, there's one by Grace. Do you want her to read out her Okay, question? so let's go ahead. So what we generally ask people to do is post your questions in the chat. We'll pull on you in the order in which they show up. My guess is uh, if if I can't get it to show up, then I'll have to rely on Aaron to identify things in the chat. But there's a small enough number of people here that I think we can also have people uh, put their you know put their questions up uh, to unmute and ask a question if the uh, if the airspace is not occupied. So let's go ahead with Grace and then we'll proceed. Okay, so Grace asks. How open were the members of the union to talking to you? What about politicians? Did you interview the donors fundraisers? Lastly, what did you tell interviewees? What's your reason for this research? These are all great questions. Um, members of the union were pretty open to talking to us because I think they were really trying to get a voice for their concerns. Um, though it was actually getting to them was sort of challenging. Um, we ended up going initially through this this arm of the organization called Working Californians, and then just sort of through connections of people in LA, you know, one person said, oh, someone I know works at DWP and kind of just snaked through them recommending who you might talk to sort of thing. Um, politicians, uh, I think in general and research are usually pretty open to speaking 
Um, it's part of their job to interface with their constituents in the public. So I've never really had a ton of issues talking to politicians. I did not talk to any donors or fundraisers, um, but I do think that that would be interesting. And then um, the way that we, we were not necessarily focused on, we, this research was funded by um, a private foundation that does work on public policy. And so the focus on the union stuff was not front and center initially. Um, we were just kind of trying to understand what the impacts of taking these three natural gas powered plants off of the off of the grid would be. So we talked to we started talking to a lot of energy experts um, and kind of realized very quickly that the conflict with the union was a major story and ended up sort of changing gears um, as we were going, which I think is also common in qualitative research. But um, I think we just really wanted to understand why. Um, what the risks and the upsides of doing, you know, of decommissioning these facilities were, and then the story kind of unraveled as it did. Thanks. Um, we do have a question that Don Beeler, who had to leave, sent me privately to ask me to ask it for you. Kelly, did you mean to turn off your video, or was that just a consequence of your unsharing your screen? Is my video off? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, okay, I didn't mean. To... Thank right. you. No, I didn't That's mean right. to do Not that. Not a big deal, but I figured you didn't necessarily want to do that. No, so no, this is my first time using WebEx, so I don't. <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> That's fine. You're doing great. Um, so the, here's Dawn's question. She said, I wonder if you could ask whether there is a move towards statewide legislation that would help alleviate the scalar tensions. This is really relevant for Maryland, given the climate legislation that lawmakers and activists here have tried to adopt. Yeah, I think that things like the renewable portfolio standard, which many states um, have these, uh, are the kinds of important state level legislations that are pieces of legislation that are currently on the books. Um, I only know the case of California and um, I think that New York state has actually, so sorry, I said, I only know the case of California and then I immediately pivoted, but I think that New York state actually has a plan um, being put forth for a state level green new deal, which is, I think a very, like Don is getting at something really important because some of these jurisdictional issues and budgeting issues, especially could be alleviated if, if sort of moving up to the state scale to try and enact these kinds of policies. Um, I think the issue is just that, um, you know, this kind of decarbonization planning is, is contentious and municipalities that have particular commitments are able to take it up. But when I imagine this being scaled up to the, the state of California level, there are a lot of communities in California that I think are not interested or supportive of this, even though I think California is generally painted to be a pretty progressive state. And so I I absolutely agree and think it's really uh, maybe a, a good solution to this to, to try and think about this at the state level instead of the municipal level. Um, but this is just kind of how it's unraveled thus far. And I'm really interested to follow the um, the case in New York and see how it goes. I wish I knew more about Maryland so that I could speak to um, what well, Dawn was getting at. Maybe if you know what she was hinting at, that Maryland, would be helpful. Maryland has a bill that I believe just passed as often as the case. I think it's been watered down a bit in terms of the targets and how to get there, but I don't know the details, although the guy who is responsible for that bill is, is one of my representatives, so I may uh, get him into the conversation at some point. So Dylan has a follow up to Don's question. Dylan, you want to go and, un and unmute and ask that question? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Kelly, um, I was really intrigued by that first kind of scalar mismatch, and I was thinking about LA being a big city, but I was also thinking about the other big cities on the West Coast that are also heavily demanding uh, electricity and are they competing with these is LA competing with other municipalities? Um, and and you know, like, I see, I see the potential there for the state to come in and kind of. Uh, uh, reduce the, the types of competition that that are in play, but uh, I, I really am, am, am. Don't know too much about what that that kind of energy landscape looks like and, and whether or not. Uh, you know, uh, that the other cities are. Or if it's a zero sum game is what I'm really trying to get at. Yeah, I I think that I would say that it is to some extent a zero sum game because uh, this situation is going to with I think it's 
it's fair in in the cases that I know on the West Coast, so the Pacific Northwest and California, um, most like the dirty power tends to be closer and not just in LA. And I I'm thinking of I grew up in San Diego. There's a num there's two nuclear power plants on the coast there. I think it's just a legacy of of where we cited things and what regulations looked like in and how comfortable people felt in the past with having those kinds of facilities in their communities and given this that that is uh i think it's not viable that those kinds of facilities as they're phased out anywhere are going to be replaced with equally power intensive facilities in the same places that um that this phenomena of the sort of um exporting of power production outside of city boundaries is going to be intensified and so there's a couple things in california um the the specific locations of the facilities that LADWP is starting to build um, are very strategic because the California Renewable Portfolio Standard, which determines which, um, and this is something I'm writing about right now and trying to think about because I think it's 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 really interesting. But but basically, there are like a number of buckets from which power outside of the state can come, and it. It's dependent on proximity to certain kinds of transmission lines. And so for power to count towards that 100% renewable, even if it's produced by renewable sources, it has to be coming from very particular places. And so there are these kinds of like pinch points on these geographies uh, that are um, admissible to the California renewable portfolio standard. So um, Arizona is one that there's like a lot of, Attention over and, and one of the quotes earlier about repurposing these lines that ran from um, a coal fired power plant on the Navajo nation that DWP owned um, and has since closed like speaks to that because they happen to have like a, a hold on a location where they can produce power that would count um, as renewable for California's purposes. Um, and I think that. This is this is the case outside of California as well that beyond, you know, with, with state level regulation counting out certain places and then certain places not being good places to produce, you know, there's certain geographies that are particularly good for producing wind power. For example, there's like a huge amount of competition for um, developing projects in these places and, you know, DWP I mentioned is unique because they're vertically integrated. So they're buying. They're they're putting their own facilities there. They've sort of created a situation for themselves. But a lot of investor-owned utilities purchase power from uh, private producers, right? So there's a real run from these like sort of independent power producers to um, build facilities in these geographies so that they will be able to sell them back to these states as they are transitioning their systems. It's it's all really interesting. Thank you. So, thank you. We've got several more questions. Um, Grace had another question, but I think Joe Gallagher has a question too. So, I'm going to go to Joe first, and then Grace, you can consolidate your two questions um, after Joe asks his question. Uh, yeah. So, um, Dylan asked about competing. For, uh, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, Dylan was asking about competition for energy generation. I'm interested in like um, LA kind of. Uh, as a competitive, like, policy actor, I was wondering if you saw that at all in your study, like, um, if any of your participants in the government realm, do they express interest in, in this, um, in LA serving as a model city for just transitions? Were there, do, are you aware of, like, visits from other C40 representatives or, like, other ways that LA's Green New Deal plan were circulated at different scales? Um, the second piece is one that I don't know about if there were other C40 representatives who came to LA um, or where specifically the Green New Deal plan was being circulated. But um, there, so the, the quote that I put up about that sustainability officer meeting with PricewaterhouseCooper and Bloomberg Associates, um, the, the that was not like the only instance of that. We got a fair amount of that from people we spoke to in the government who you know, very frankly said that this is creating a model for the nation. We want LA to be a model for the nation of how 
to go 100% renewable. So I, I think that it was very clear that that they were trying to do this kind of pol maybe policy entrepreneurship or something, right? They were trying, they were taking this funding to come up with this cutting edge plan that they hoped would make LA like a centerpiece or a model. Um, and I think that's very common in, you know, New York, LA, San Francisco, some of the big DC, right? That big cities often um, undertake like major policy initiatives to serve as as a model for future um, future planning. Um, so yeah, I definitely did see that that kind of come through in the way that government officials talked about it. Um, I, I I do want to look into this. Where is the LA Green New Deal plan circulating? Question because I wouldn't be surprised if it's circulating in the sort of international entrepreneurial policy making community in all sorts of places. But um, I don't have a straightforward answer um, yet. So thanks for bringing that up, though. Thanks, Grace. You're up. Hi, Kelly. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, so did you find any solutions um, for the negative impacts that the Green New Deal um, put onto the uh, union workers during this process? Um, and I know this is like a big complex question or issue. So I was just wondering if something specific popped up that you noticed helped them. Yeah, um, you know, so one of the things that has been, you know, unraveling since is that LADWP is is running this like multi stakeholder equity process where they are going to affected constituencies to try and figure out what they can do to make sure that the rollout of this plan by 2035 is going to be equitable and that at that point. And that's actually what got me interested in IPP because I realized that these constituencies were not uh, being involved in these consultative processes that are really important for sort of setting the future. But this was, to their mind, the point where labor should have come into the equation. And so they've now been meeting, um, you know, they've hired consultants. There's always consultants. They've hired uh, consultants to start meeting with these affected communities and, and are now trying to sit down um, with labor but it's sort of, if I think that the impression is it's a little bit too little too late and they're starting to make plans for, um, you know, so at, at UCLA, for example, one of my colleagues has been tapped to do a study on workforce impacts of this planning, but uh, those folks who are impacted are going to be impacted, I, I think would have wanted to be involved from the beginning. And so I think that that piece is really important. And one counter example, um, that I think has been much more successful is that so this year, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you know this, I think it's sort of unusual that LA has one of the largest urban oil fields in the US. There's a, a huge amount of oil drilling um, in Long Beach um, and in South LA and historically um, Black and Latinx neighborhoods um, in LA. There's a, a long tradition of, of oil drilling that's still going on. Um, and this year it was, you know, we've banned urban oil drilling in several municipalities in LA. And there have also been a whole lot of regulations about setbacks from things like schools, um, elderly care facilities, you know, places where you probably shouldn't be drilling for oil. Uh, but because the, this was going to impact oil workers and obviously it's not really clear. I mean, DWP could sort of shuffle the chairs around in the union and find, or in, yeah, in the, in the utility and find other jobs, but the clo effective closure of the oil industry in Los Angeles was going to put a lot of workers out of work. And so what they did at the county level straight away was they formed something called the just transitions task force as they were thinking about how to enact this legislation. Um, and they in involved organized labor, environmental groups, local politicians, um, other kinds of experts, academics, and they met regularly. You know, they really tried to come to a solution about how to best handle these issues. I'm sorry to cut you off. Was that group just like community oriented? Like it was kind of like a voluntary type meeting thing or? Yeah, it was, it was a voluntary meeting convened by the county of Los Angeles and they 
um, invited all of these actors to participate. And from my understanding, it's actually been fairly successful at capturing everybody's concerns prior to making any policy, like hard policy decisions. And obviously it's not perfect and people are not 100% happy, but it, it is kind of night and day, the, the shutdown of urban oil drilling versus the closure of Haynes Harbor and Scattered Good. And I think it has to do with this, this ongoing process. So I actually have a quick follow up and that is um, when, when you showed the IPP and commented that the goal ultimately is to convert that to green hydrogen, they're not doing that in LA, but it strikes me if that were technically feasible, that would actually be potential solution for the for the union in LA. Is that is that just not on the horizon soon enough to be able to um, uh, to envision that kind of conversion in LA or what, what's the status of that? I think that the status of what is to be done with these facilities when they're closed is really up in the air right now. Um, so one big proposal that was being put forth was um, batteries to use them for battery storage. Um, and that is maybe not technically like the technology is not there yet for the storage to be condensed enough for you to sort of use that same footprint to be able to store, say, solar power. Um, I think, you know, green hydrogen, one of my big concerns about it is that it it can be sort of volatile. And there was an, ex I think it was in Beirut, an explosion um, a couple of years ago of chemicals that were being stored at the port. Um, and I think a lot of people have pointed to that as like keeping the, the hydrogen, which is is kind of combustible in the city is dangerous. And the planet IPP, which is absolutely, like fascinating to me is that basically in that part of Utah, there are these huge underground salt caverns. And so their plan is to store the green hydrogen underground in these salt caverns next to IPP, which they see as safer because there's maybe less people around. But um, so I think maybe if they can get the tech, I think the under the, the thinking is that if they can get the technology right at IPP, that green hydrogen is a possible um, solution for bringing back to these facilities. And then in the interim that maybe they sit dormant or maybe they are peaker plants, right? If we're having like an emergency, then you can turn them on or that they're used for battery storage temporarily. Um, but it's all very speculative right now, you know? And um, the fact that no utility has been able to sort of successfully do these kinds of green hydrogen product projects um, is, it, you know, maybe they'll pull it off. It would be exciting if they could, but um, I am a little bit concerned about the fact that they're sort of doing it far away and not really mm -hmm. having, you know, these kinds of engagements with the people in Delta. So we are just past one o'clock. There is one question that Jack Solomon posted. If you can stick around for another couple of minutes. Yeah, um, for sure. People are having to leave, but we're going to preserve this on the recording. So I think, you know, as long as there's interesting questions and you're able to. So, Jack, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I can try to kind of block my voice you, right now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, I was just wondering, uh, based on a few of the questions that were asked, um, a lot of the policy just seems to like affect communities, not just in the city or in the state, but like outside of the state entirely, like through uh, power importing. And I might have missed like if this was brought up, but is there any like uh, focus and like uh, like policy like work on how LA or like statewide green policy green deal policies like impact uh, workers in other states and like any interstate cooperation uh, to help like or even interstate research on how uh, these communities would be affected by these uh, deals or yeah, so uh, is it would that require like federal action to deal with? So IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the union in question here is a national union, right? So the unions tend to have locals all over the country. And so a lot of this coordination work um, has been done by organized labor actually and thinking about how, um, you know, how this scales up. And it's it's tricky, right? Because 
uh, an IBEW mm -hmm. member in another state might benefit from a policy that's harming a member in Los Angeles. And so there has been some of this. I think it's important to note, and maybe I should have started here, that you know these municipal scale Green New Deal plans were attempts to try and you know, there were multiple, you know, since the Obama administration with green jobs and things, there have been like multiple iterations of these federal plans that would then require interstate cooperation and would sort of scale down. And just, um, you know, with the Biden's Build Back Better, the infrastructure plan, which I think was sort of the latest iteration of one of these kinds of Green New Deal type plans, uh, you know, not not working. Um, Many, many municipalities then said, okay, well, we're going to start from the bottom up and the, the comment, I think my feeling there is that there are, there are some pros to this, but issues with exactly what you raise these sorts of uh, interstate cooperation issues. And that I think that that trying to operate ideally from a federal level would probably help to ameliorate some of these problems, but at least in Don's question raised this right at least maybe trying to think. Um, at the state or regional level is important if you cannot have these kinds of um, federal interventions where there is big money and big time and the ability to make these kinds of longer term commitments. Okay, thanks so much. I think we're going to um, end the recording. Uh, Kelly, if you stick around for a minute afterwards, I want to ask you something that doesn't need to be part of the recording, but thanks so sure. much, Kelly, for fascinating. Uh, Discussion, uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that have to be considered that sometimes don't get considered in advance. And I guess 1 advantage of a project like this, if it's going to be a model for the nation is also to uncover problems that need to be looked at when they come up elsewhere. Thanks also to Aaron uh, for co hosting. I'm going to end the recording you, now and we'll see everybody hopefully next week and the recording is stopping now. <laughs>